Okay. So, um, so what, what was eating like uh, during the Renaissance and Leonardo da Vinci in the kitchen? Can you envision him in the kitchen? So um, in this PowerPoint, I, well, in this presentation, actually, I would try to introduce you or answer a question regarding the overview, well, the, this topic. There will be an overview of the Renaissance period, exactly what the Renaissance was, what meant, what means Renaissance. The evolution of the medieval culinary arts, uh, because uh, as we will see, the um, the Renaissance uh, cuisine is actually a continuation or building on uh, the uh, medieval uh, the medieval um, the medieval uh, um, tradition. Okay, I'm not gonna check. Uh, sorry, uh, the chat anymore. If you have. Uh, problems uh, with uh, with the audio in my video computer okay um so what was on the tables of the renaissance and especially what does what did the meal time look like at the medici's uh, court and then uh, a little bit uh, on uh, feasting and entertainment extravaganza so the Renaissance, what was the Renaissance? Uh, a little bit on the timeline. So the Renaissance begins really around, uh, uh, what well, there is not an exact date. Uh, these are just uh, an idea to give an idea of what the, the period is like. Uh, when, okay, when we can really uh, start seeing certain uh, uh, characteristic. So more or less, uh, begins let's say around around the 1300 and it will actually uh, kind of uh, go through um, uh, the 1500s and uh, and then uh, when uh, the maximum in Italy is around uh, 1527 and then from there it would spread all over Europe and it was I would actually linger on uh, in uh, in northern Europe. So in the 1300, there is the birth of humanism, although Dante had already um, preceded the humanistic uh, thought uh, at least a hundred years before. And uh, uh, in the 1400, there is the rise of the Medici family and of Rome. The popes go back to Rome and they start building the city that had really uh, run down uh, during the last uh, centuries. And, uh, and then the 1500s begins <clears throat> the age of exploration, thanks to Columbus, uh, Bartolomeo Diaz, and Vasco da Gama. Um, the key events of the Renaissance, uh, then uh, uh, 1529, Cosimo de' Medici becomes uh, officially, the Medici family becomes officially, become officially really the rulers of Florence, uh, or one of the most uh, powerful families of Florence, but they managed to become the leaders of Florence. Uh, he inherited the banks uh, from his father and, uh, and, and, and Cosimo is responsible for consolidating this, uh, this power of, that the Medici family had. The Medici at this point had uh, a large influence all over Europe uh, and they are very well connected with the courts uh, of, uh, of, and the nobility and, uh, and the wealthy of all Europe because they really, their banks and their money, Il Fiorino is very, um, is a very good currency. Everybody wants to have Fiorino because was based uh, on gold. In uh, 1454, Gutenberg uh, invents uh, the press and he publishes the first Bible, Bible, revolutionizing further the thoughts and the ideas of that time. In 1492, Christophorus Columbus arrives at the Bahamas and so opens an entire new world for the Europeans. Uh, new routes, uh, new um, markets. Although um, Italy, uh, which is at the maximum of its uh, splendor at this time, really would take uh, a little while to really, um, and 
in Europe as well to really uh, capitalize on this new discovery because they really the, um, the what it meant uh, to have opened this new route uh, will really bring its fruits uh, by the middle of uh, the 1500s. 1505, Michelangelo completes David. Uh, 1513, Machiavelli publishes The Prince. Uh, all in the early 1500s at the peak of the Renaissance. And as I said, in Italy kind of the Renaissance finishes or ends, uh, obviously not ends, uh, it will continue, but generally the Estonian marks the end of the Renaissance in Italy, in Italy around 1527 when Rome was sacked by, uh, by the armies of the uh, German uh, Holy Emperor. And in 1570, the first uh, modern atlas is published, uh, finally mm, giving a, a visual view of the new world, uh, what the planet really looks like. Uh, it is but in our own day that uh, men, they are uh, both uh, that they see the dawn of better things. Now indeed may every thoughtful spirit thank God that he has been permitted to be born in this new age, so full of hope and promise, which already rejoices in a greater array of nobly gifted soul than the world has seen in the thousand years which preceded it. This in this quote uh, really gives an idea of what uh, the Renaissance meant for the people who lived uh, during this time, which is also embodied in the beautiful painting of Botticelli. Botticelli, La Primavera or Springtime really embodies the essence of the spirit. The Renaissance uh, is the pinnacle moment of a journey that had begun in uh, the uh, around the uh, uh, thousand, the year thousand, and that uh, uh, continues through the Middle Ages. By the way, the Middle Ages, it's a term that was uh, uh, created by the Renaissance artists, um, historians actually, sorry, historians, to really uh, separate themselves from the past. Uh, it was theocentric, god center. So the main focus was uh, that um, the, uh, God was at the center of everything. And, um, and, uh, and so they were interested in tracing God, the continuity of his creation in, uh, and find uh, um, evidence of this unfolding in the everyday life. So man's, the, the man's view was divine. Well, this view of man and 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 uh, and, and I, this idea of God being at the center of everything actually gets changed uh, in the Renaissance because now man is put it uh, man is put at the center of uh, of um, of the world um, because uh, in during the Renaissance actually they they there is a return to trust uh, in the human's ability, in uh, human's capacity for uh, uh, being able to, to learn. Uh, there is, uh, like, so like, uh, it's a new age. And, uh, and also the terms dark ages, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a term that it's coined by the Renaissance, but obviously they were not dark ages because actually if the Renaissance was able to become what it became through was exactly through the period just before. Uh, and so and so la, as the Renaissance really embodies uh, what La Primavera was saying, uh, uh, represent a new age, uh, human, the celebration of human dignity, uh, naturalism, perfection, beauty, knowledge. Uh, the free graces are the symbols, the free graces, uh, uh, the, the symbol of uh, perfection, beauty, and knowledge. I'm sorry, uh, 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 wealth, equilibrium, and composure. The, the whole, so the, they are part of the, of the entire uh, setting. And uh, once again, Italian culture dominates Europe uh, during the Roman times. And now, once again, Italy is at the center of Europe, of European culture. Um, it's, as I said earlier, it's a developing uh, period. 
uh, and that tries to uh, transcend the ideals and beliefs that preceded it. Um, in th between the 13 and the 1500, Italians are uh, looking back at the classical antiquity. They want to go back to the roots uh, of the ancient Romans. Uh, and in part, this is uh, due also that new uh, manuscripts uh, were uh, discovered and actually, uh, especially the works of Plato, and make their way to uh, European uh, centers for uh, uh, study. But actually, also it's because now the um the the historians uh, the intellectual are actually uh, digging deeper in the libraries and are and are finding uh, books that have been overlooked during uh, the middle ages that they were not uh, studied before and uh, and so in by in looking in, in to to explore this heritage in the meantime uh, during the renaissance a new uh, fields are born, archaeology, numismatic, iconography, history, anatomy, uh, philology, the study of uh, Latin and Greek. So there is a kind of a, whereas in the Middle Ages, in the age before there was with Dante, the father of it was, uh, but anyway, there was an emphasis on the vernacular languages. And so to speak in the language that the people uh, are, uh, are speaking, now there's actually a return to the Latin, but to the classical Latin. Obviously, the vernacular languages don't go away, but there is a return to the study or, or to expressing themselves in a very um, eloquent Latin, in an educated Latin. Um, so the values and style of the antiquity are more congenial to the, to the spirit of the new age, uh, and especially life, and, and this can be seen the life and letter, education and politics, moral and ethics, art and culture, and even cooking. And this is an example, visual example of this before and after. But Wait a second, it's not that the Middle Ages uh, had canceled and erased uh, what happened before, of course not. The values and style were, uh, the Middle Ages were also borrowed from classical antiquity, but instead of being elaborated, they were simply copied, uh, copied form of the dogma, because again, they were trying to um, uh, in interpret these uh, through, the, 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 uh, through uh, their, uh, their, uh, their, uh, their theology, the religious thought, the uh, Christian thought. And, uh, and again, uh, exactly, so understanding the God's plans for humanity. Um, on the other hand, uh, the Renaissance is looking at those same theme and styles, but they use them in a completely different uh, way. Um, they brought this uh, style and theme, uh, these um, ideals that were in this classical uh, um, uh, time, they brought back to, to life. And so uh, they, it's a more dynamic spirit behind the form that they recapture. <clears throat> And uh, so here, the before copying, merely copying, now is really doing. And so here we have uh, a copy of, uh, of uh, a transcript uh, from uh, a manuscript, a, a scrap from uh, Cicero that they go back. And, uh, and, uh, and also there is a change of the handwriting. Um, during the Renaissance, uh, the Gothic style had been preferred, and now we are going back to the um, uh, Caroline minuscule script, which is the one that we are still using today. <clears throat> um, Florence really <clears throat> exemplifies, uh, if we, well, in, in Italy, Florence exemplify the Renaissance, this new period. Um, Florence, because of its uh, <clears throat> um, um, uh, the way it was uh, the, at the time, really exemplifies the values uh, of this new period. Uh, it was a Republican city state, uh, which was ruled by a merchant. Uh, uh, 
patria, patria state, patria state uh, nobility by a merchant nobility. And uh, the, the economy of Florence uh, was in manufacturing, long distance trade, banking, uh, and the, the wealth and power of uh, very powerful families, not only the Medici's, but others as well. And uh, this powerful family really invested uh, in libraries, libraries, churches, academics, uh, which were in tune with Renaissance ideals. In Florence, uh, your wealth uh, was shown uh, also from what you ate, what you wore, but, abs but absolutely who you were patronizing and which artwork you had in your house, who were the artists that you were uh, um, financing the project and, uh, and, and, uh, and the project that you also were uh, um, investing in. <clears throat> so food and cuisine in the Renaissance. Um, well, <clears throat> the, the wealthy family and city states, uh, okay, the, in the, during this time, there is a period of peace, uh, relatively peace, compared to uh, the, the, the age before, uh, but or the 200 years before, but war, you know, wars, wars are always uh, outside the door. And so uh, the city says they are always trying to uh, increase uh, their uh, territories and uh, in order to increase their food, uh, their food supplies. Um, uh, and uh, okay, uh, eating, eating and uh, eating practice and habits uh, uh, really are different uh, between uh, the urban and the rural. So because the Renaissance, uh, uh, or actually during the period before, we really see a birth uh, of cities, of urban centers. And so diet really gets differentiated between uh, who lives in the city and who lives uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the countryside. And then within the city, the distinction between the classes, the poor, the peasants versus the nobility or the wealthy and outside uh, as well. So how they ate and what they ate. Again, at the beginning, the uh, cuisine, Renaissance cuisine is, is not else, is nothing else, the a continuation of the medieval, medieval culinary traditions. And uh, how they ate. Um, well, the medieval attitudes towards uh, food persisted during the Renaissance. Uh, food was, uh, for the early part of the Renaissance actually, food was seen as essential for survival and uh, sustainability. So it was not uh, um, uh, a source, uh, sorry, I made a mistake. It was not really a source of pleasure. Uh, overindulging in food was seen as uh, a sin because it was equal to gluttony. But later in the Renaissance, actually, this attitude towards food would change, especially among the wealthy, because they really were eager to show their, uh, their wealth through their diet. Um, then uh, um, uh, food really uh, rotated around the liturgical calendar. Uh, there were uh, almost a hundred. There were 150 uh, days uh, in which uh, um, people had to lean, had to observe uh, lean or fast, uh, lean or fasting diets. Uh, so there were middays and lean days, uh, which meant that Fridays and Sundays were always fish. You couldn't eat meat. Um, there, there were religious holidays that had particular uh, diets, uh, and then uh, also social gatherings, uh, uh, like a wedding, birth, and funerals, and that the, during this social gatherings, eating will be also uh, different. Um, um, Okay, 
um, well, the late medieval period and early Renaissance, Foda is also a balancing act with the individual temperament, uh, something left over and that will uh, be carried on for, again, uh, other, um, almost until um, the modern medicine, really, uh, that this idea of a, of a balancing act comes from uh, the ancient Greek, uh, ancient Greek medicine, and, uh, and from uh, the physician Gale, uh, who, according to uh, the, the belief of medicine at the time, uh, uh, health was related to a balancing of our funda fundamental fluids that, uh, that we had. And so these were also translated in, in, uh, in eating because eating, according to them, eating would actually um, create, uh, could potentially uh, alter this balance. Um, the traditional wisdom was feed of feed cold, but starve fever. Uh, and then it was based on this, on this uh, concept of the chain of being. Um, and so how the rich and the poor should eat. This chain of being, this uh, sort of uh, uh, hierarchy of all living things, uh, animate and inanimate, uh, that had a particular uh, order. The lower you were, the higher you were, the di your diet would be different. Uh, and, uh, and it was according to on which layers you lived. So the, the, the closer you were to the ground, like, uh, the peasant or like the farmer so the the simple and the and the uh, crude uh, quote unquote uh, food you will eat but the higher you were in this hierarchy so the more lavish and the more elaborate food that you were uh, uh, able to eat so basically that meant that for farmer and, um, and poor closer to the ground that their diet was uh, was based on uh, carrots, turnips, onion, garlic, pig, so everything that was really close to the ground, whereas for the nobility was all on, more on meat, uh, game, uh, fruits, uh, also courtyard uh, animals, but not uh, some courtyard animal uh, more than others because some were not proper for them. Uh, so what they ate was also based so on the climate, the environment, and the geographical region, and laws passed uh, with the increase of um, so that with the increase of uh, farming on, of the um, lands that were, that were for farming, and for eventually uh, there were lands uh, that were uh, laws that were uh, passed. Uh, concerning uh, the distribution and the ownership uh, of this land. And there was privatization. So this meant that uh, for a large portion of the population, uh, basically um, um, this privatization uh, took away uh, re foods resources for them, from, for them. And so that's why they, they had to, and so they were forced to change di their, their diets. They had no other choice. Um, the, uh, was also based on the birth of urban centers. As I said, uh, eating in the city was somewhat different than eating uh, in the in the countryside, including for the the, the poor or the or uh, the low classes in the city. Uh, population growth. Uh, social status. So, in fact, uh, um, it's not uh, much about quality around uh, the Renaissance as a much quantity. So obviously the wealthy and the nobility ate more than the others. The food more or less was the same, but uh, the quantity was really what made the difference. Dietary regimes before 1550, because with the discovery of the new world, uh, even though yes, uh, the Americas are discovered in uh, at, the, at, the, at the end of the 1400s, well, uh, the, the staples from this uh, uh, area would not arrive uh, in Europe before, or certainly in Italy before this date. Uh, one thing that was common to both uh, classes for everyone was bread and wine. 
for the populace and the poor uh, meant that was the first was the main source for calories. Uh, especially after the privatizations of forest. Uh, food, bread was given uh, and was eaten even by the lowest of the lowest. Uh, for the poor, it was made with mixed grain, so dark bread, whereas for the nobility, it was white, and the whiter, the more expensive. Um, <clears throat> Uh, it was uh, to accompany the everything, companaticum. So you would eat bread with something. It, it was often unsalted and unleavened, uh, especially in Tuscany. And even to this day, there is a tradition of on salt because salt uh, was uh, uh, taxed and at time it was blocked during war. Uh, like in Florence, um, uh, Florence many many times uh, uh, had salt uh, tax uh, or blocked by the neighborhood and city, especially Pisa, uh, when they were trying to make war with Florence. And uh, many recipes are based on stale bread, like the Florentine ribollita soup. Um, the rich, the nobility, uh, enjoyed elaborate pastry pies and fritters. And, uh, and I've read there were also different levels of digestibility, uh, depending on how the bread was made. Wine. Wine was enjoyed by everyone. There was a little bit decline during the, long, the Longobard era, but then it bounced immediately back. Uh, the peasant made their own wine. Uh, um, the, the, the quality of wine became so good that there was no reason anymore to dilute it with water uh, of must or flavor it with other spices. Uh, it was drunk by everyone. Water was not something that people drank at the time, even children. Wine was uh, what was, uh, what was uh, uh, drink. Uh, what was drunk and uh, being drunk in public though was scorned so it was not a good thing and some of the common grapes uh, that some are still present today uh, Prosecco, Falernum, Sangiovese, Montepioscone, Chianti, Albano and Nebbiolo and actually nowadays there is also uh, an attempt to actually um, bring back some of the vines that were there during the Renaissance era that actually have kind of uh, sort of disappeared. So there is an attempt today to bring back those uh, uh, wine, type of wines. So, um, what they ate, uh, the commoners, uh, well, these are the, some of the ingredients. Commoners was all about uh, wheat, barley, so grains, all kinds of grains that they were cooked to the point that there would be kind of a, a porridge, polenta. Polenta was very uh, common already at the time, but not uh, made with corn. Like today, if you go to Italy and you ask for polenta, especially in Northern Italy, they will give it to you with corn. But at the time it was not made with corn. Uh, guess what? Why was not? Um, Legumes uh, were the main staple and source of protein for the commoners. Um, all kinds of beans. Uh, and there was also was a native uh, autochthon um, uh, type of bean in Italy, the black eye bean. Uh, that was from the Mediterranean era, a Mediterranean basin. Uh, vegetables from the east and the Mediterranean area like uh, all the green spinach, eggplant, artichokes from the Middle East, uh, all kinds of radishes, cabbages, uh, roots, uh, squash. Actually, there was a kind of squash uh, native of, uh, the, of uh, Italy. Uh, otherwise, uh, also squash and zucchinis are something that will come from uh, the New World, like the beans, in case you haven't, uh, so the, like the beans. Uh, aromatic herbs and meat, uh, poultry, <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> pigs and boar, cows, sheep, goats, uh, and uh, and eventually in the, around this time, the what Italy is famous for the salumi, so the cured meats, uh, uh, so the art of curing meat uh, is born around this era, salumen for salt. Um, poultry, poultry uh, was uh, 
definitely enjoyed more by the commoners than the wealthy, <clears throat> uh, especially chicken. Uh, the wealthy, the, their diet was absolutely, it was based on social status. So they, they ate, okay, meat. That was a part of their social status, uh, especially game, uh, the privilege and the aristocratic classes. Peacock was the epitome of delicacy uh, and a sign of wealth and affluence. Um, in the uh, fish, actually fish contrary to the Romans is not that one coming from the sea, but from uh, lakes and rivers. Absolutely no legumes, uh, kind of, well, no, I shouldn't say yeah, absolutely, but legumes were not favored by the noble and the wealthy because of a certain uh, thing that happens to your body after you eat the legumes, and it was not considered refined. In fact, it was considered crude and so a uh, food uh, better suited for the commoners. And then fruits. <clears throat> Uh, dairy products, although cheese uh, was not considered uh, uh, food uh, uh, or uh, uh, for, actually cheese was considered food for the poor, but not for the wealthy. Uh, and it will not be used until later on in the 1500 when a famous uh, chef uh, uh, started using and in uh, preparing the dishes for uh, the popes. Uh, eggs was also another very important uh, uh, food uh, and, and source of protein for uh, for the poor, and uh, and that's why there are so many uh, recipes in Italy that are based with eggs, uh, pasta, cakes, uh, uh, sweet and sour, uh, omelets, uh, the famous Italian frittata. Uh, sugar was the main. Uh, um, um, ingredient for preparing this uh, for, for preparing uh, recipe sugars was uh, it was called oh the sweet salt it was in every dish uh, renaissance people uh, in the renaissance uh, people loved sugar uh, salt uh, was another one used and then spices all kind of spices olive oil and uh, uh, butter and lard uh, it's also very used in preparing the foods, uh, preparing uh, recipes. And here are some uh, of the, what would have been uh, looked like if you were going to, if you were to go to shop uh, at, uh, at, at the time in a supermarket of, you know, <laughs> there were markets. And, uh, and so we have a butcher, we have baker, uh, we have a cheese maker, uh, a, 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 a fish market, a cuisine. So that's what it would have looked like uh, a shop. And here are some of the food uh, of the of the time. Uh, dietary regimen after 1550. So the new world has, uh, has brought, uh, brings over new products. Uh, and so corn, tomatoes, potatoes, beans, turkey, bell peppers, peanuts, pumpkins, cocoa beans, tobacco, I put there even though it's not really food, squash, a new variety. Uh, these new ingredients change the way the recipes are prepared. Some ingredients disappear like, uh, and some get substituted. For example, uh, the goose gets substituted with turkey that comes from uh, uh, America. And uh, um, sugar cane, that was a sugar cane that actually from Europe gets brought to the Americas. Uh, and so now the production of sugar uh, increases. And so sugar, the, the product of sugar is also brought from the Americas. Uh, that's why there were a lot of sugar. It was very expensive, but the sugar was really used in everything. Um, tobacco, tobacco and cocoa though, have uh, first uh, huge success in Europe. Uh, put it, uh, 
potatoes and tomatoes will come a little later. And actually tomatoes for uh, quite some time would not be eaten because they, since they were red, they were considered to be poisonous. Okay, and here are other examples of ingredients uh, and uh, that you were seen on a table uh, uh, after the 1550 of wealthy people or some of the ingredients that you would have seen uh, in uh, some of the food that you've seen in a, in a market. And uh, this market, or so again, you would buy food at the market, or there were actually uh, people uh, uh, walking, so vendor on foot uh, selling whatever they had make. So what would the Medici eat and serve at their guest? By the <clears throat> the Medici were so powerful uh, in Florence that uh, really they were sometimes the subject matter of uh, a lot of paintings like Botticelli. And uh, Botticelli, one of the many uh, artists, uh, wonderful artists of the Renaissance period patronized by uh, non- by, patronized by the, the Medici family. And certainly uh, one of the highest figures of the uh, Botticelli family is uh, Lorenzo uh, de' Medici, uh, known as the Magnificent. Uh, called the Magnificent because he surrounded himself uh, of, uh, of a court uh, of, uh, in his court uh, by artists uh, and uh, he patronized uh, all kinds of arts and not just um, figurative artists, uh, but also created an academy for the uh, pursuit of new ideas, an academy for philosophy and, um, and the writing arts. And Ludovico uh, and um, Lorenzo itself was uh, a, a poet. He vuole essere lieto sia because di domani non c'è non ve certezza. This adagio is really also the uh, center of the idea of living at the time. So live the moment, uh, enjoy the moment because you're not sure about what could happen tomorrow. So during every day there were uh, uh, two meals served. Uh, most common around noon and dusk. Later on, uh, when the preparation of uh, the, the dishes, of, so cooking becomes more elaborate, and so it requires, there are more times, uh, 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 there is, yeah, they, they need more time to prepare their dishes, uh, then there were small snack uh, eaten uh, during um, when people would wake up, so the birth of breakfast. Um, and there were several courses, not just one. Uh, it, what it would serve, soup, um, again, uh, uh, was um, uh, all kinds of soups made with vegetables and uh, with meat. Although meat was uh, the um, uh, soups made by, with meat were expensive. Um, they had to please, please the eye as well the taste. Uh, so they were made with a lot of aromatic herbs uh, and, uh, and spices. Um, roast, uh, sirloin beef was the one preferred. But contrary to what we think, uh, or we think of roast, uh, that we immediately put uh, uh, a roast uh, on, uh, on, uh, on a bird and start roasting, the process of roasting, actually in, uh, the, the meat were first boiled. And apparently that was uh, boiled before, before then roasted. And apparently that was because uh, the meat were particularly uh, tough, chewy. And so in order to make them more uh, uh, digestible, and easy to eat, uh, they were boiled uh, first. And then there were a lot of stew. Uh, around this time, uh, uh, the uh, stew made with entrails and the less noble parts of the animal becomes a huge hit. 
um, uh, the the wealthy or who could afford it uh, was crazy about these two with this in, uh, with this uh, uh, lower parts of the animals. Um, we will have salads. Uh, we have all sort of uh, greens dressed like uh, what we do today. Uh, fish uh, after generally served after salads, uh, pastas, and uh, which still lingers today. All the varieties of stuffed pastas were born during, uh, uh, were actually uh, uh, are continued during this time because they were really uh, started during. Yeah, remember that the, the Renaissance really continued the medieval culinary traditions. So the stuff pasta go, goes this back, go the, the, this far. And uh, in fact, ravioli are even mentioned, uh, are mentioned in Boccaccio's novel. And, uh, and so during Boccaccio is really of the um, period before the Renaissance. Uh, spaghetti. Uh, already present, uh, the spaghetti were present in uh, in Italy uh, since uh, um, the, the Greek. Um, uh, there, uh, there probably were brought over from the Greek, uh, and uh, and so in fact uh, uh, there is. Uh, um, uh, evidence uh, of writers uh, uh, writing about this uh, kind of pasta being uh, essicated in Palermo. Uh, pastries, uh, savory and sweet. The famous torte salate, Italian torte salate, savory pastry, uh, were uh, also of this, uh, um, well, were eaten and enjoyed of this time. Uh, seasoning, uh, verjuice was uh, very much uh, used, uh, which was uh, a mixture of uh, uh, juice uh, and of sorrel, and, uh, and uh, um, which was uh, a salad herb. Uh, so this juice of uh, the salad herb mixed with uh, um, uh, citruses, uh, vinegar, and um, and, uh, mm -hmm. and then, of course, the, the fruits, uh, which they prepared a lot of pastries. That was uh, during an everyday meal. But what about banquets? Well, banquets were uh, a lavish deal. There were up to 10 to 12 courses. They began with uh, appetizer uh, called Servizi di Credenza. And later we will see what a credenza was. Uh, and so there were every, you know, everything that could be served uh, uh, cold, so cold, uh, cold foods, to then continue with the entrees, uh, which were pasta and uh, soup. And then we would move on to uh, uh, we will continue with uh, no, uh, pasta and uh, no, sorry, the okay. Um, so we would so we will uh, okay. Sorry the. Uh, is jumping. Okay. So we had entrees and then we will continue. Okay. Uh, or uh, uh, we had appetizers, we had pastas, and then uh, again, uh, we will have uh, uh, meat uh, to follow. And so this is uh, what it will look like uh, a typical uh, menu. Uh, of uh, of the of these uh, banquets, so there there were first courses and second courses, and then uh, uh, dessert desserts. 
uh, one thing that was really uh, uh, um, an extravaganza was the creation of a statue, miniature statue using sugar. And even Leonardo da Vinci and Tatian uh, um, uh, indulged or, uh, no, or uh, participated into this uh, um, uh, art form, uh, creating uh, a sculpture. And that what it will look like a table of a banquet. And uh, what uh, a kitchen looked like uh, during the Renaissance. Uh, and uh, some of the display. Bartolomeo Scacchi was uh, one of the most famous, uh, one of the many famous uh, chef of the time. And uh, for uh, for the poor, for the one who could not, were not invited to some of these banquets, well, the tavern, the osterie, or the inns, or wine shop, that's where they will get their meal. And uh, obviously, it was not as lavished. Generally, it was uh, soup and beans or uh, fruits. <clears throat> so feasting and entertainment extravaganza. Uh, the banquet provided, well, the banquet also uh, provided extravaganza, yes, but also, okay, uh, well, not just uh, the, uh, um, uh, yeah, in this time, hygiene, and so, yeah, in, the, in this banquets uh, also is, um, is introduced. Um, so they were really paying attention, actually, they were really paying attention to manners uh, and uh, some very basic uh, 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 hygienic practices, basically. <clears throat> they provided, so dancing and entertaining, entertainment, and then afterward there were, for the drinks and dessert, uh, a banquet generally could last several hours. There are records of a banquet beginning uh, in the afternoon uh, and ending in the early hours of the morning. Uh, the guests were provided so with water in which they could uh, wash their hands uh, and towels, and um, and the towel the. Um, uh, and, and, and every time that there, there would be new dishes, so in between dishes, they would actually were invited to wash their hands. The table sets, uh, the table were set with tablecloths, which were also removed at every, after every uh, uh, course or after every dish, so that there would be a clean uh, tablecloth and clean plates uh, for uh, each dish. So this is what it looked like. So one course, for one course, there might have been a hundred dish, uh, dishes for each course, uh, because uh, maybe that's how many people were invited, uh, which meant that there were a, a, a total of a thousand dishes for lavish banquets. So for a, a wedding, for example, um, uh, or uh, yeah, like for a, a Medici's wedding or, uh, or for a Pope elections. So quite a few dishes. And, um, but however, there was also a hierarchy. There were a lot of dishes. There were a lot of courses. Uh, and there were a lot of dishes prepared for each course, but not every person got to enjoy the same uh, dishes because uh, generally the most uh, luxurious dishes like peacocks would be given to the most important uh, people at the table. Uh, so um, the table setting had the regular spoon and knife but uh, after 1500, the fork is introduced. Uh, another uh, interesting fact, the toothpick became uh, an ornament to wear like a jewel. So in a necklace or in the girdle, and it was made with silver or gold. And uh, it was uh, elaborately made in the shape uh, of a cupid, of mermaids. 
Um, also around this time, uh, the birth of a dining area or the dining room uh, is uh, uh, born. Um, so around 1500, in the, um, in the 1400s, an area of the house uh, is designated uh, for the dining, uh, um, for the as a dining room, uh, sala in Italiano. Uh, the ceilings are and and the, and the walls are beautiful, beautifully decorated, and is also uh, located in an area that it's easy for the servants uh, and uh, to go back and forth from the kitchen. <clears throat> Oh, I wanted to point out, uh, yes, in this little painting, exactly a, a detail of a lady using her toothpick. <coughs> and uh, this is an example of a dining, what a dining uh, room, uh, dining room would have looked like with uh, beautiful frescoes. This is uh, from uh, in Rome. Uh, today, the Farnesina in Trastevere, Rome. Uh, it was uh, in the summertime, they could actually open and uh, uh, have fresh air come in, or during the winter, they could, they will close it. And these are some of the frescoes that um, decorated this uh, dining rooms. And, uh, and this is also another uh, fresco on a credenza. A credenza was nothing uh, which I men mentioned before, where the cold cuts or the cold food were uh, uh, stored, cold cuts and cold foods were stored. And the credenza was nothing else than our modern cupboard. more uh, uh, sugar sculpture that also um, with which Leonardo da Vinci and Titian experimented. They were not edible. They were just for the pleasure of being seen. So entertainment. Uh, since banquet lasted for many, many hours, well, the guests had to be entertained. Uh, so in uh, in the courts there were always at least uh, two dwarfs uh, dwarfs employed uh, that they were and were used as a buffoon or buffoons or jester. Um, but even the staff working, so the waiters, the uh, the cooks, uh, uh, were part of the entertainment uh, um, of the of the guest. Uh, and, uh, and 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 for this, so the new uh, professions were also created. Uh, so there were uh, meat uh, meat carvers. Uh, there were uh, people serving the wines, uh, people serving, and and the cook. Uh, music, so there were musicians and uh, um, fireworks as well. And this is a typical scene of a banquet. Uh, um, um, a painting made uh, by Botticelli commemorating the wedding of a wealthy uh, Florentine family. And so Leonardo da Vinci, what does Leonardo da Vinci has to do with food except for sculpting sugar structure? Leonardo, da, Leonardo, it's best known though as the artist. That's why he was sculpting, you know, sugar structure. Leonardo is also, famous for his inventions, for his engineering. And Leonardo is also famous for his anatomy, for his study of anatomy. Well, one thing that people I, or one uh, thing that people are not so aware is that also Leonardo had a huge influence also in the kitchen. 
my painting and my sculpture would stand comparisons with that of any other artist. I'm supreme at telling riddles and tying knots, and I make cakes that are without compare. This is what he wrote uh, in his letter um, for uh, while asking for a job uh, to the Duke of Milan, the future actually Duke of Milan. Um, uh, Ludovico Sforza. So Leonardo was also an entertainment. So an entertainer, an entertainer. So Leonardo gets uh, to Milan at the court of Ludovico Sforza uh, as uh, an entertainer. Um, yeah, a painter, engineer, mathematician, and uh, he also was a wedding planner uh, from uh, 1489 to 1493. He coordinating the wedding plans of uh, the uh, Duke, uh, um, the Duke of Milan, Ludovico Sforza's nephew, uh, and to Isabel of Aragon, the, the daughter of the um, King of Naples. Uh, the ceremony, he planned the ceremony, uh, and in uh, planning. Sophie, I need you to full disclose when you're done. Mm -hmm. um, Okay, uh, I'm sorry. Could you please unmute? Uh, so he created a representation of heaven and uh, revolving planets. As the couple walked through this display, each planet would open, revealing a person that uh, would uh, uh, recite a poem. Uh, for this wedding, he created the menu, the menu, the entertainment and uh, decoration, and uh, he also dictated what people should wear, had to wear for this wedding, and uh, and also designed their hats. Uh, Ludovico Sforza was so impressed by what he did to his nephew for his nephew that he actually decided to use his service for his own wedding to Princess Beatrice d'Este when he married into the Este family, another one of the very famous uh, uh, family of Renaissance Italy. For them, he created uh, something like a 200 foot long edible altar, uh, uh, only to find out that uh, <laughs> the rats have eaten the, had eaten the altar. And so guess what? The wedding or the, the, the banquet had to be postponed because it had to be recreated. Uh, so there are, along with uh, all notebooks of, which, uh, of, we, of whom, uh, uh, for which is famous uh, on anatomy, uh, his invention, etc. there are tons of notebooks also on matters on related to cooking. Uh, there are shopping lists that he made uh, while uh, for the Sforza, uh, diets, uh, the, the dietary regimens. Uh, people think, uh, or there is a belief that he was vegetarian, that, or, or that he, but he might have actually uh, preferred eating vegetables uh, rather than meat. Uh, there are recipes and, uh, and even plans uh, to, for new inventions for the kitchen. As a young man, uh, while working as an apprentice to the Verrocchio um, a shop, uh, he also worked as a cook uh, in, uh, in Florence, the Tavern of the Free Snail, a very low level restaurant where only one food, uh, the, the main food was snails that were served. And here are some of the inventions uh, that he fought uh, for the kitchen. Uh, we have uh, a whisker uh, and uh, a, uh, a roast, uh, a device for roasting. So a whisker that was uh, supposed to be a giant whisker that it was supposed to be turned by, um, by a man. So in conclusion, uh, the Renaissance is uh, an important uh, event for European history. 
that stretch between the 14th century and the 17th century. Um, it was preceded by the Middle Ages, uh, uh, and then it was uh, uh, succeeded eventually would lead to the age of enlightenment. Um, the food uh, during the Renaissance uh, reached uh, a, its climax in Italy. Uh, the French king was so, especially Francis I, was so impressed with Italian culinary uh, uh, tradition that he brought it to France. Um, and, uh, and, and with the food, so the gastronomic luxury of uh, Italian tradition, also the art of good living uh, was exported uh, uh, throughout Europe. So I hope uh, the presentation uh, uh, explains some of the reason that we eat what we eat. And, uh, and hopefully you got some uh, ideas on how, on what to prepare. Um, so this concludes uh, the uh, presentation. I'm gonna stop share. And so now I'm ready to take some questions. If you have questions, I hope you enjoyed. Okay, all right. So if you don't have uh, questions, I guess uh, we can... Uh, um, I hope you find it useful. Did you find it useful at least? Some feedback? Is there anything that uh, you didn't know or that you find it uh, curious? That was very interesting. The one thing you didn't mention is you said something about polenta not being made of corn. Was that because the corn was all being used for livestock? No, it's because corn uh, had not arrived uh, in, uh, in Italy yet. It arrives after 1550. So before 1550, I mean, I'm sorry, yeah. Before 15, oh, after uh, the discovery of the new continent. So there was something made, um, so there was this, uh, so polenta was made, but it was not made with corn. Like, as I was saying today, if you go to Italy and ask for polenta, they will serve you with, coal, with corn. But at the time, corn was not, uh, was not in Europe yet. So it was made with the other grains, like uh, basically wheat, uh, barley, cream, but it was overcooked wheat. and made into a mush. Right, it was like cream of wheat, because even now, well, my family used to eat something called polenta dolce, which was made with cream of wheat. Yes. Uh, yeah. Also oatmeal. Yes. So basically, it was grain that it was really cooked, uh, overcooked until it would really dissolve and become like uh, a pastry. Mm -hmm. And uh, Larry and Lynn, I know you are from Piedmont. Well, the, you still have uh, a recipe that it's very famous in Piedmont of entrails. Uh, and uh, that, that was uh, born uh, during the Renaissance. And really, the, um, maybe I didn't emphasize enough, but modern cuisine, what we eat today, it's rooted uh, back uh, to that era. So everything that uh, uh, dishes that we prepare today are, uh, were prepared back then. Definitely, every time now uh, you go to a restaurant and you enjoy the uh, tortelli, tortellini, any kind, or oh, any kind of stuffed food, by the way, not just pasta, but any kind of stuffed food comes from the Renaissance. That was a, a continuation of the medieval uh, tradition. Um, I just wanted to say thank you. That was so interesting. And I really love the way you included both um, the rich and then everyone else so that we could see how they ate as well. So that it was very interesting. Thank you. Yes, thank yes. you. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, um, uh, in the certainly. Um, in the city, the poor uh, or the less wealthy in the, in the city eat close or would find ingredients that are very close to what the nobility would eat. Uh, 
uh, obviously the lower of the lowest eight uh, only bread. Uh, whereas uh, in the countryside, there was more of uh, a varied uh, diet. So they, they would eat uh, kind of sort of different. So in the city, people ate whatever was brought from the, uh, into the city from the countryside. And uh, chickens, uh, chickens uh, for a long time were, uh, uh, or courtyard animals, actually, I should say, courtyard animals uh, were more enjoyed uh, by the, the poor, by, or, or in the countryside poor, because that's something that they could actually uh, raise on their own. And uh, they, they, they were not forbidden because, for example, after the privatization, they could not hunt anymore. And uh, hunting was also a big practice for people that allowed them to survive. And so once uh, the forests were privatized, uh, people were really thrown out of, uh, we should say, supermarkets. Um, anything, uh, any other uh, uh, questions? Yeah. It's very interesting, like many cuisines, the rich ate a lot of meat and the poor ate a lot of grains and produce and legumes. And now what we consider healthiest is what was peasant food. Absolutely. And yeah, so uh, it's, it's just always interesting to me and it happened across many cuisines, I think. But that chain of being, that I, I mentioned that idea of this uh, uh, hierarchy of uh, animate and inanimate world and the balancing of the fluids uh, that I was mentioning. Well, guess what? Uh, a lot of sayings that, today, that we have and a lot of ideas that we have about our health, which we know that are folklore, are really a lingering from that era. And um, and that I mean that's part of our heritage. Today we laugh at it uh, and we think uh, that oh that's nonsense. But but that was but that was science uh, at the time, because for uh, a, a long time that's how uh, medicine or medicine was based on those ideas. That's why they used to talk about you know healthy farmer stock and things like that because that that. Some of that healthy diet was what produced um, some of the longevity in people who worked the land, people who were farmers, people who were not necessarily of the higher socioeconomic class. Exactly. And in fact, there are uh, thoughts uh, or debate whether maybe Leonardo da Vinci, who of Leonardo da Vinci ate meat, of course, but he preferred uh, or, uh, or, or he preferred to eat um, or, or his diet was more based on uh, uh, vegetables. And some, uh, you know, speculate that may be the reason why he lived such an old age, which I mean, really, he lived twice uh, the age of an average uh, person at the time was it might have been due to the fact mm -hmm. that he ate uh, a diet that was primarily uh, vegetarian or based more on eating vegetables than than meat. Um, so any anything else? Um, I was just in Venice recently, and my friend mentioned that she never sees chicken on the menu, or very rarely is there chicken on the menu in Venice. And that's very interesting from what you were saying, that chicken wasn't, uh, wasn't a food for the elite. And yes. I wondered if that has something to do with the fact that it didn't develop into the Venetian cuisine so much. It I don't know. Be. It could be, yeah. but also on the other hand, okay. Uh, okay, the Renaissance, they go back to the ancient Romans, right? They look at right. everything that the Romans did. Well, fish, especially from the sea, was a huge, uh, a huge staple for the, for the Romans, but not during the Renaissance. And so during the Renaissance, uh, fish uh, from the sea is not used as much as uh, the one from lake and uh, lakes and rivers, but not for Venice. And the reason right. was right. Venice uh, was uh, 
Uh, and then another interesting thing, uh, glasses, I, I forgot to mention the presentation, um, glasses. Uh, for a long time, people uh, drank in mugs. Glasses were not uh, uh, used on the banquets until eventually the Venetian glass uh, uh, would uh, oh. really be... Um, uh, we can say, well, we can use the word exported because at the time there were different states, and so they were they were in part of Italy. So the Republic of Venice was a state of, uh, and so yeah, the Republic uh, of Venice eventually exported uh, glasses, uh, wine glasses, also to other areas. Um, <clears throat> um, anything else? Very interesting. I really enjoyed